Hi, this is Gareth Ainsworth, and you're listening to the Wick and Wanderers Show. Welcome along to the latest edition of the Wick and Wanderers Show. Lots to bring you in the next hour as we count down to kick off on Sunday at 12.30, the visit of Portsmouth to Adams Park in a televised game. We'll hear from the manager, who will also remind us what, what time of year it is. In case there's any doubt uh, at all. We'll catch up with Phil in a few moments' time as well to uh, build up to that game. Uh, we'll continue our focus with ex-players, thanks to the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association. Uh, Graham McKenzie, we'll be hearing from him, a uh, midfielder come winger from the 70s who uh, has not been seen on a field <laughs> in this area uh, for more than 40 years, but he was at the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association annual dinner last week. Uh, we'll be hearing from him. Uh, we'll chat to Craig as well to uh, bring us the latest from Wickham Wanderers Women. Uh, they played on Sunday. Uh, perhaps uh, you took up the offer, uh, a very special offer on for uh, the season ticket holders of the uh, men's team to pop along to the Burnham Stadium and see high-flying Ascot in action. Uh, we'll find out uh, the latest and uh, who's still to come for them in the remainder of the season and uh, players to watch and that sort of thing. Uh, with Craig on the way as well later on this hour. But first... Uh, we have tonight to start the show with uh, some highlights from the last game. Oh no, no, there isn't a last game. <laughs> Whoops, I uh, know that won't work. We can't. St- <laughs> there wasn't a game on Saturday, but we did speak to Phil last week, of course, you might recall, and uh, sort of uh, set out with him his proposals for the Saturday because uh, he wouldn't be bringing us live match commentary on Wanderers TV or Wickham Sound. Here's what he got up to. I went to Wingate and Finchley versus Enfield Town in the Isthmian Premier um, because I scanned all the fixtures everywhere and there wasn't really anything going on in London. Um, uh, so I thought, well, I need to go to a game really because it's not always nice to go to a game as a fan and maybe have a couple of drinks and, and a few beers and watch a, watch a match, something that as a commentator I don't get to do. So uh, very lucky to be a commentator, but I'd, when I can, I like to kind of watch a game if we get a chance uh, just as a fan uh, and I thought maybe I might be able to find the next Chris Farino who it turned out played at Wingate and finished it for a bit um, so yeah that's what I did on Saturday and it, it was very good and an enjoyable experience because your options we, we discussed were rather limited by industrial action on the railways but but brilliant that you, you managed to you get to a fixture yeah I walked um, Wingate and is about 3.7 miles from my house so I was able to walk there uh, and get a bus back. So, yeah, no trains were, were used, uh, even if they were on strike. Um, so, yes, yeah, it was good. Um, really good experience. And I have to say, like, popping down to lower league and non-league um, is really good because you get you can wander around, you can watch the game from any part of the stadium. Uh, you can change positions, walk around, change stands even. Uh, great food, uh, bumps into a couple of old mates and then uh, yeah, a couple of drinks. And the game was pretty good as well. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Didn't see the next Anis from Etty or Chris Farino. Uh, that's not to say they weren't there to my untrained eye. But, yeah, no one <laughs> stood out. But, yeah, good game. You didn't bring any players away with you and say, like, you could do a job. <laughs> Sign here, lads. Come on. <laughs> this way. Uh, no, n- none of that. None of that, no. Must be nice for the players and, and manager, though, to have that time, you know, a bit of a break from from the busy fixture schedule and really kind of preparing uh, for, the, for the game coming up on Sunday, though. Yeah, it was one of the questions I asked Gareth last time we spoke to him uh, after Cheltenham because it was a disappointing performance as well as a disappointing result. Uh, and then looking at the down the barrel of a 15-day break in between games, you think, well, is it a good time to have this break? Um, and I suppose if you look at it, if you were going into that break on a really good run of wins and form, um, then you wouldn't want to stop playing. So maybe it was a good opportunity to, to kind of take stock a bit, um, rest up, um, obviously they've been working hard at the training ground in between as well but um, I don't know just take stock of where they're at this season five points off the playoffs uh, it's a pretty congested league I think there's all still to play for but it's been inconsistent and stop start for Wickham in terms of their form and performances and results um, so maybe it's come at a good time I think we'll find out on Sunday won't we whether it's a good or a bad time <laughs> um, but yeah I'm sure they would have used the, um, the circumstances to their best advantage as Gareth Fainsworth always likes to do and we've discussed recently as well how hard the team's been hit by injuries. And as I say, it must be a great opportunity for them to, to recover their fitness too. Yeah, I think, you know, we've got a few coming back now, a few have come back too, and it's been probably a good opportunity for them to continue to build their fitness, although they can't get that match sharpness up at the training ground. But, you know, I spoke to Josh Goen this week and it was really interesting to chat to him about, um, you know, those two games he came back um, from his two-month injury um, so he's got that bit of game speed up as well. But he was just sort of, yeah, 
good to, to kind of spend a few more days up at the training ground and, and working on that fitness. So important to Wickham Wanderers, Josh Gowan as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's just hopefully giving a few more days for, for players coming back and getting their fitness as well. So uh, we'll see. And I'm, I'm sure Gareth Ains will be looking at changes as well from that team that did start against Cheltenham. So it'll be interesting to see what options he's got. And fans will be hoping for a return of the, the ballot, bat, battling qualities that have been shown previously and also obviously cutting out those defensive errors too. Yeah, I mean, we had that run of set pieces, didn't we? And looking at Sunday's opponents, Portsmouth, uh, Danny Cowley, takes, takes a very similar approach to the game to Gareth Ainsworth. So I think set pieces will be key. Um, they're always tight games against Pompey uh, and they're always tight games when it's Danny Cowley in charge as well. I remember some games against Lincoln when he was in charge between the two clubs and I think one of those games away at Lincoln, I don't think we even needed a ball for that game. It was He could have just let them sort of grapple it out in the centre circle for 90 minutes. Um, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how this one pans out. The last time he played an early kickoff on a Sunday, I think, it was a 3-3 draw against Sunderland. So, uh, it would be great if there's that much excitement. But I think whatever happens with Wickham after their run of form, I think we'll just take any form of win at home against Pompey on Sunday, really. If it's a 1-0 and it's uh, a scrappy goal, then so be it. Um, but yeah, I think to do that, we'd have to cut out the defensive errors and make sure we're, we're watertight as set pieces against what will be a very competitive Pompey team. Great opportunity for fans to come along and, and, and back the team, obviously, and, and two sides, obviously, who are going for going for promotion as well. Yeah, uh, Pompey, a uh, big club in League One, not the biggest in League One, ironically. Um, we've got some bigger teams in there as well, but you know, Fratton Park is a fantastic stadium. They fill it up regularly. They've got um, you know, a high-profile American owner as well. Um, so the pressure is on for those guys to do well. And I think anything outside of the top six for them would be seen as a massive disappointment, um, as it would be for Wickham because of where we've been in recent time as well. So this is a bit of a marker for Wickham because we've had games against, you know, and I say this with all due respect, against the likes of Port Vale, um, Cambridge, Cheltenham, uh, these these teams here, they're, they're teams in Forest Green. These are teams more of our sort of size and stature and similar history. Whereas you don't have to roll the clock back too far to find that Pompey were, you know, winning the FA Cup, being in the Premier League, etc. Of course, they've had their problems, but um, but yeah, these, this is a bit of a um, a game against what I would say one of the big boys in the division and a team that's expected to be up there. And historically, under Gareth Ainsworth, we always seem to lift ourselves um, for these games um, but we've seen a bit of a change in the psyche of this team haven't we because we always used to be able to come back when we were a goal down and that fighting spirit and that doesn't seem to be as intense as it has been in previous years and we're a little bit in transition I think so I think Sunday will be a really good indicator as to where we are in that transition process. And for any supporters that won't be able to make the game obviously it's on, on TV as well and, and sounds really interesting with the, the innovation that's been put into that and, and the access that fans will get it doesn't sound like the manager uh, quite will be uh, delving into you know, what you have for breakfast and that sort of thing but uh, it's a great great opportunity for supporters to get sort of some behind the scenes stuff Absolutely yeah I think it's interesting what the EFL and Sky are looking at I mean Sky are just sort of kicking their heels this month aren't they because they haven't got any World Cup coverage so I think they've taken a really good attitude to it and thought right let's see what we can do um, with this game and, and look at about how it can be applied to the football coverage uh, moving forwards. And, you know, great that they've chosen this fixture with Kawandras versus Pompey. I think it's the only TV game, domestic TV game on uh, on Sunday. I think there's another game on Sunday. I think England are playing Senegal, but, you know, we're all really worried about the uh, Wick and Pompey game, really. Um, but, yeah, it's, I think um, I was speaking to Gareth about it the other day and it, it, he kind of touched on the kind of the American nature of it of this sort of access to all areas and this sort of insatiable appetite for fans and stuff to find out more and more. And and it kind of goes against the grain, doesn't it? Because we all know Gareth is incredibly secretive about injury news and, and, and other stuff in general. And football managers see that the dressing room is very much their domain and what goes on, you know, behind that closed door is very much down to them. Um, and, and they like to keep it that way. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how that works out because... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think they'll be able to broadcast much of what's said at half time in either changing room. Um, they tend to be quite feisty places, but yeah, let's see what happens with it. It'd be interesting. So, um, yeah, and uh, I mean, I'll, if you want, I can ask Gareth what he has for breakfast if you want after the game. Yes, please. Yeah, it'd be good to know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you might know already. Um, <laughs> uh, it sounds like a brilliant encounter. Thank you so much, Steve, for your time. Lots to look forward to. No, nice one. It's also it's on TV, but more importantly, it's on Wicked Sound as well, Colin. Let's not forget. Oh, yes. Very innovative there as well. We should mention that. 
<laughs> Great to chat to Phil, of course, the head of audio and broadcast at Wickham Wanderers, host of Ringing the Blues, and also, of course, uh, the uh, excellent uh, match commentator on Wanderers TV and here on Wickham Sound as well. Uh, he and uh, Wickham Wanderers staff offer their uh, Christmas due uh, this evening at the Hellfire Comedy Club at uh, Wickham Swan Old Town Hall. You might have heard him mention a little earlier on that he caught up with Josh Scohan this week uh, as well, uh, so I thought it would be really nice to uh, share that uh, with you. And, of course, uh, Josh and uh, the rest of the players have uh, been enjoying a bit of time off. We can go away, spend time with the family and kind of forget about football for a few days. So um, the boys are feeling good. They've got some fresh legs now and ready to kick on. And how are you getting on? Because you had that long break for injury then came back just before this break. Uh, yeah, no, feeling good. I think the rest come at a good time for me because obviously I had two weeks like non-stop and then it's come at a good time for me to refresh and now ready to kick on. That match sharpness that everyone talks about, that's what it's all about, isn't it? It Was it frustrating because you'd really got into your groove this season, hadn't you, in that midfield position, and then that injury came probably at the very wrong time for you and the club? Yeah, for me, it was very frustrating. I felt good. I felt, you know, I was picking up some results, and yeah, like you say, I was feeling sharp, and yeah, it's just one of the things that happened. But um, yeah, I'm glad I'm back now, and I'm ready to kick on for the rest of the season. It came in the Accrington Stanley game. On the commentary, we had Wickham Wanderers legend Steve Brown, who played very similarly to you, did lives yeah. the tackle. He was absolutely waxing lyrical about your performance that night. Yeah. And then that was the last time we saw you. It happened in that game? Yeah, it happened in the game, and I felt it at the time, but just managed to play through it. And then it was the following days, it felt a bit sore. But yeah, I went for a scan and told me I ruptured a ligament in my knee. So, yeah, like I say, it's one of them things that happened, and I'm sure it won't be the last. Hope, hope touch with it's not. Well, I don't know how to say it, but um, yeah. You don't want it to happen again. Yeah, I don't, obviously don't want it to happen again, but you could you, say football and the way I play is, is a good chance of it. But. You don't score many, but you got your, your first goal of this season very early on. So uh, has that set the platform now? You're back to add to that tally? Yeah, well, obviously it'd be nice to add to the tally, but as long as we're winning games, I don't, I'm not that fast. I just want to win games. But um, yeah, it'd be nice to get hopefully maybe one or two more. And what's it like having Alfie Mawson back? Because I know you're, you guys are pretty close off off the pitch as well. No, he's obviously a great lad. Um, everyone knows what he can do on the pitch. You know, he's proven it uh, at every level. So, um, but no, he's good for the boys. He's good in the change room. He's vocal, and like you say, a few of the younger lads can can learn off him and use his experience. And psychologically, this game, Pompey, one of the bigger teams in this division, we've probably had a run of uh, against teams of a similar size and stature of Wickham Wanderers. When these big boys come to town, Wickham in the past have really upped themselves for that game. Is that what it's going to be like on Sunday? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, like you say, we, we've done well against the big teams in, in previous years. But um, again, like we we back ourselves against anyone. So um, yeah, well, the boys will be up for it. I'll be up for it. And hopefully the fans get up for it as well. Only domestic game on TV on Sunday as well. What's it like playing in front of the national cameras? Like, to be fair, you don't really think about it too much. Like, you know, like boys will joke about it and things like that. But um, yeah, like for me, it's just another game. You know, it's a game I want to go out and win and give my all. And are you aware there's going to be a bit of extra footage this time? There's going to be a camera in the dressing room. We've been told, and I think the gaffer's going to do a bit more press as well during the game. Is that something you're aware of? As, uh, oh, I wasn't until just now, but. Um... <laughs> Yeah, like I say, it'll only be good for it'll be good for the fans to see what goes on behind the scenes, and yeah, it'll, it'll be a good, yeah, good football. Well, hopefully they see a win and they get to see what it's like in the changing room afterwards. Yeah, they, they, hopefully we, we get a win and then they can see some celebrations and yeah it'll be good great to hear from Josh you can hear that interview in full on Wanderers TV uh, where Josh gives a bit of insight as to uh, what it's like at the training ground uh, especially amongst the uh, uh, Welsh contingent uh, especially since uh, the, the World Cup's been underway <laughs> uh, more to come on the Wicked Wanderers show as well uh, parts 2 and 3 to follow online on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM this is Wickham Sound. Still to come on this week's edition of the Wickham Wanderer Show, we'll hear from manager Gareth Ainsworth, who reminds us what time of year it is. Uh, also uh, talks about what he's been doing in his uh, sort of week off. Well, it's not really been a week off, but a break without football over the weekend. And uh, we'll chat to Craig as well to bring you the latest on Wickham Wanderers women. But first, it doesn't seem like uh, just over a week ago that the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association annual dinner took place at Adams Park. Uh, one person who uh, was back after a very long spell of uh, not returning to the area. Uh, was uh, a certain gentleman who uh, played as a midfielder slash winger uh, for the Wanderers at Lokes Park in the 70s. Uh, his name is Graham McKenzie and I've uh, been catching up with him to find out his earliest memories of his time at the club. I was uh, 17. I was at Wellsbourne School in High Wycombe and uh, our teacher, we had a very good school football team and uh, one of our teachers, John Pratt, not the John Pratt who played for Spurs, but 
a goalkeeper who'd played for Reading, and um, he suggested during my sixth form at Wellsbourne that I, I think he recommended me to Brian, but anyway, I was invited to pre-season training at Bisham Abbey, and that was my first ever experience. So what were your initial impressions? Uh, well, obviously I was very young, I was much younger than everybody else. <laughs> I was very impressed with... The players were all amateur internationals. You had people like, you know, Larry Pritchard, all these top players playing there. And um, I was just a whippersnapper. So I just turned up, did my presenting, didn't expect anything really. And the next minute, Brian Lee's uh, asked me to sign on. So I did. And I was delighted with all those very good, experienced players. And I was very impressed by Brian straight away. Because I understand he had some interesting dressing room techniques. He never, he didn't speak very much to you. He, the only time you knew uh, he rated you as a player was if you were selected. He never explained why you were left out. He never explained why you were in. You know, he just, you just, when the team was read out, he thought, well, I must have done well this week. And, uh, you know, if, if, your team, if your name wasn't in it, you thought, well, obviously not my turn this week. But that was, that was my approach to it anyway. That was how I felt about it. And are there any particular sort of games or incidents that really stand out from your time at the club? A lot, really. But, um, I mean, I was there for the games against Middlesbrough, although I wasn't actually in the playing squad. Uh, I think we had a squad of about 18 people, something like that. So I was in the squad but didn't actually get on the pitch at all during that uh, competition. Yeah, I mean, I, t- to be honest, I used to love the, um, the training. We used to have this... I'm sure other players of the area will tell you as well. We had 18 players... And at training, we had nine light blue tracksuits and nine dark blue tracksuits. And so the training was very, very competitive because you kept those tracksuits throughout the whole season. So it was your team, if you like. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the uh, training was fantastic, really good. And people like uh, (laughs) John Maskell uh, took it ultra seriously. Well, everyone did, to be honest. uh, I suppose uh, one of the best stories was when I tried to chip John one of my early training sessions there, we were playing, having shooting practice, and I chipped him. And he chased me halfway around the training field trying to get hold of me. And uh, without using the language he used, which is quite colourful, <laughs> he uh, explained to me that if he caught me, he'd kill me because I was taking a mickey out of him, you know, trying to chip him. And uh, he said, you would never do that in a game, so don't ever do it in training. Now, things like that, stick in your mind when you're 17 because you think oh yeah I could do you know you're, you're a cocky 17 year old and you think you can do that to anybody but what he said stuck with me throughout my career because you play the the lower risk percentage shot you know you know what I mean instead of you know taking a massive risk you're going to play what what you think will work if you know what I mean and so my time at uh, Wiccan was more of an education learning off people like that and it stood me in good stead later on in my career. And winning two Isthmian League titles, that must have been you know, quite highlights to be part of that squad. Yeah, it was. Although at the time, I, I didn't realise the sort of how important it was. You know, I was 17, I was just enjoying football. I wasn't really thinking about it, you know. Um, 17, 18, you know, I was just enjoying my time. I, I, I Almost, I came to expect it. That was what was expected, you know. Which was also good for me as well, in a funny way. Because it set standards. And if you fall below those standards, you're not going to achieve anything, you know. And also, being an England schoolboy international, that must have been pretty special as well. Well, yeah. I, I, well, it was my first year at Wickham. And um, I, as I said, I was playing for Wellsbourne, but I was also playing for the county side. And fortunately got into, you know, trials for the England schoolboy team and um, played against uh, Scotland at Old Trafford uh, and Wales at Ninian Park. Managed to score in Ninian Park. Uh, we had a penalty and I, I managed to score quite early on, which was great. I also understand you were involved in a bit of controversy when it comes to the Bucks and Bucks Cup. Cause, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the story all, <laughs> always comes up. I am innocent, honestly, Gov. Um, <laughs> no, uh, uh, what had happened was, uh, after my first two years at Wickham, so we're talking summer of 75, 76, I was going off to Cheltenham to do my teacher training. And I did my pre-season training. Brian said, look, you're not going to be involved with us. He was very friendly with Tony Williams, who used to write the Rothmans football yearbook. And uh, Rothmans sponsored the Isthmian League at the time. 
and um, Tony was chairman, I believe, or president of Hungerford Town. So, because I was going off to college, Tony said to Brian, could Graham come and play for us for half a dozen games before he goes to college because you're not going to be using him you know, the rest of the season? So I agreed. I didn't drive, so um, someone used to come and pick me up from High Wycombe, take me to Hungerford, drop me off, pick me, sorry, pick me back up, and so on. Well, I played half a dozen games, thought no more about it. February time came. I got a phone call at college. I hadn't played for Wickham all season because, you know, of my commitments at Teach Training College. Got a phone call from Wickham. We're short of players, illness, injury. Can you come and play? So I got the coach down, played against Chesham. We won, I believe, 4 2. And then, um, oh, and I scored. And also, and then I went back to Cheltenham on the Sunday. My mum rang me midweek and said, You're all over the papers. Apparently, you were cup tied. <laughs> and I said, oh, I didn't know anything about that. Anyway, apparently, Earlier on in the season, I'd played in one of those games for Hungford. I'd played in a preliminary round or qualifying round for the Bucks and Bucks Senior and scored. So some astute statistician was looking at the, the figures and saw G. McKenzie scoring for Hungerford way back in August or September, and then G. McKenzie scoring for Wickham in um, February. So I think Wickham withdrew from the competition. Brian Lee hated the Bucks and Bucks committee anyway. He was always falling out with them. I think they wouldn't let us enter the London Senior Cup. And at that time, that was a more prestigious competition than the Barks and Boats Cup. So Brian was forever falling out with them. So in many ways, he didn't care that we had to withdraw. And, but the, the funny story was, was the previous season, we'd won it. And Brian refused to let us receive our medals or trophy. And I can't remember why, to be perfectly honest. Again, it was a falling out with Brian. So for two years in a row, we didn't get... Uh, our medals that we should, we deserved because of various reasons. Me being the one for the second one. <laughs> and did it feel like at that time? Because you get to chat to, to different players from different eras, and and you get the impression that it felt like at the time, you know, their their group was especially special. Did it really feel like at the time that you were you were part of quite a special group at Lokes Park? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Although I was seventeen and I didn't know any different in the sense that I had no other experience of non-league sides. You knew you were in the presence of some really good players. I mean, I played for England schoolboys. I, I played for the county for many, t- many times. I was, I was a, a good... I, I'd got in the final squad of the Scotland under-15s before I came down. Because my dad was in the RAF, so I travelled around a lot. So before we came down to England when I was about 15, so I was about 14, I'd got into the final trial of the Scotland under-15 team. But didn't make it. And then came down here... And so I was a good player in that sense, but and I could and I'm, uh, I was good at my level, if you know what I mean. But when when I went to play for Wickham, it took it to another level. You could see there's so many players here, and we're talking Larry Pritchard, who was probably about 30 when I signed, and like I was 17. The youngest player to me, I believe, was Mick Holyfield, and he was about 24. So Mickey and all the lads sort of took me under their wing. And kind of, kind of taught me the ropes and things like that. But I could, I could see that it was a really, really good standard. And Brian kind of, he wasn't a disciplinarian, but he, but he was a kind of, you know, he was like a school teacher uh, in the sense that he, he, he signed good players and then expected them to play. He didn't really do much coaching. You know, he just expected players to play as he wanted. But, so there's no, not much coaching going on, just... I've picked you, you're good enough, get on with it kind of thing. No, yes, it's, it's, it's a strange sort of approach to imagine, isn't it? Especially with the modern game and, and how, how football's changed so much. Uh, uh, that's exact, but I think that's the way exactly you should approach it. When I left, because I, I'd got a teaching job in Gloucestershire, so, uh, you know, at the end of my college, so a new manager, I think it was Andy Williams who came at that point, I could tell didn't really fancy me as a player. And I was going to have to do the travelling down from Cheltenham anyway, so the club agreed to let me go so anyway I signed for Cheltenham but I played for Cheltenham under Dennis Allen and Terry Payne I played for the, under those two now they were both professional players had long careers and freshmen but I didn't have anywhere near the same respect for them as I did for Brian because Brian expected the game to be played in a certain way you know, in terms of your behaviour it wasn't so much about coaching you but those lads Dennis Allen and Terry Payne tried to coach you but you were, 
you knew your game, if you know what I mean. I felt I knew my game. I didn't need coaching. That sounds arrogant. I don't mean it to sound like that. But they didn't let you express it, didn't let you play the way, you know, you sort of grew up to play kind of thing. So in many ways, I think coaching gets rid of the people's natural ability sometimes. But Brian just let you play. And it wasn't until I came across Graham Olner, who was... Uh, my assistant at, in my fourth year at Cheltenham, and he went off and started, uh, uh, became manager at AP Leamington, and I went with him as his captain. And that's where I met Kim Casey, actually, because Kim was a very young player there who arrived at the same time as me. Graham Oller was like Brian Lee. You know, he let you play, and, and picking you was enough, if you know what I mean. Picking you was your vindication to play in your own way. And I carried on those values that Brian Lee had installed, instilled in me and, and the older players throughout my career actually yeah until I retired you know it was a, it was a very good grounding very good education for me so Alan Phillips was another uh, former teammate of yours I understand there's a current beef <laughs> well that's about the the, the, the the Barks and Bucks Cup as well <laughs> because because the previous year Alan was sat with me at the dinner and he said to me we didn't get our medals that year because of you he said in the following year he, he played, I can't remember him playing actually in this one, but he says he played in the 1975 final when we played Thatcham, funnily enough, at Chesham. And we won, and I can't remember much about it. I remember we were winning quite easily. We won about 4-0. And I can remember sitting in the changing room afterwards and Brian Lee locking the door and said, we're not going out there to receive our medals. And um, the Barks and Bucks committee hammering on the door saying, come on, you've got to come out for the presentation. And Brian said, no, we're not coming out. And apparently, I don't know what the outcome of that was. I know we didn't get our medals. Uh, apparently, the outcome was the, the um, trophy was awarded to Thatcham, even though they lost to us 4-0. Huh. And Alan Phillips said he played in that game, so didn't get his medal because of that game. And then the following year, didn't get his medal again because <laughs> of me. Uh, so, so he wasn't happy with me at the dinner. Also, I need to ask you about your own coaching trail. Yeah. Um, well, I kind of... I played... Obviously, I went to I played for Cheltenham for a few years. Then I went to Leamington, and then I went on to Kidderminster, um, where I played and, and with Kim and uh, Graham Oller, the manager. And after I left, I, I finished playing and uh, decided to become a coach. But found that I was a better coach on the field than I was off the field. What I mean by that was. I was a kind of the manager's man on the field, if you know what I mean. I was not the best player, but I was probably one of the most influential players in trying to get the players to play like the manager wanted. You know, I was a kind of the Jordan Henderson of, of you know, the kind of make everybody else play, but not the best player yourself kind of thing. But when I became a coach, I couldn't put that into practice like I could on the field. I didn't have the same influence and I didn't have the same ways of getting things across which frustrated me no end to the point where despite being a teacher I found it very difficult to be patient with players at that level who couldn't do what I thought were simple things you know Richard Forsyth took over from me in the midfield at Kidminster Harris now he was a very good player Richard a better player than me but if for some reason he couldn't we had these free kicks and corners I used to take and I used to, maybe I hit them in a particular way, but, but I couldn't get Richard to do the same thing. So even though the whole team <laughs> was set up for these free kicks and, and, and corners that worked with us, when Richard took over from me, he couldn't hit it in quite the same way. Uh, to do with timing, I don't know, trajectory of the ball, whatever. But I couldn't get it across to him how to do it. And I found it immensely frustrating. So much so that even though I got my full badge and everything like that, I never really went into coaching. I, I concentrated on uh, teaching after that and, and just gave up the kind of uh, semi-pro stuff, uh, coaching. I just stopped, you know, like mid-30s. I, I suddenly I, I realised I didn't have the patience for it, basically. It must have been so special, though, for you to have played for the club, you know, in the town where you went to school and, you know, grew up and, and represented Wickham at that time. Yeah, it was. Um, again, I, I, I say that I didn't fully appreciate it. I appreciate it much more now, looking back, at the time, you're just living the moment, you know, you're not really aware of it. I was aware that it was very unusual for someone. I mean, I was the only player, apart from Bodger, who lived in Wickham. And 
Bodger was must have been 32, 33 when I signed. I was 17. He, he must be about 15. Years. I don't know how old Bodger is now, but he, I, I'm 66. He must be early 80s or about 80. I know Mask is about 78, 79. So I was the only person who lived in Wickham apart from, uh, apart from Bodger. There were other lads who lived quite close. Dave Bullock at the time lived quite close, but not many people lived there. But at the time, I didn't see that as a big deal. But when you look back on it, you think, actually, that was quite unusual. There weren't many people doing it. And I mean, all those England internationals, like Keith Mead and Terry Reardon, and all these people who played for years and years, Keith Searle, Steve Perrin, top-level players, and you're part of that. And you think, wow. As I say, at the time, I didn't realize how important it was. But the, the longer my career went on, I realized how important that time was to me as a player, but also as a person. Well, as a person at all. And you mentioned the dinner. Great for you to be back in, in the area and you know, with the likes of Kim again and seeing so many other uh, old faces as well. Yeah, it was great. I mean, Kim, we, we, we didn't realise. we played. Kim and I played together for about oh, 10 years, I suppose. Yeah, we played a couple of years at Leamington. Because when, we, when I left Cheltenham, Graham Olner went to Leamington. Uh, his first manager's job. He was only about 30, 31. He'd had to retire with a knee injury. And he'd come to Cheltenham as an assistant. And he and I, I was captain. And he and I hit it off. We, understood, we played, wanted to play the game the same way. Just like, he was just like Brian Lee in many ways. And he went off to Leamington to start his own, you know, get his own first manager's job. And he asked me to go as his captain. So I did. And I was 26 and I was the oldest player. He, brought, he put together a brand new team. And they were all kind of 20, 21-year-olds, including a young Kim Casey. Anyway, we won the Southern League at our first attempt and uh, we didn't get promoted into the conference which is now now the national league but we didn't get promoted because our ground was owned by ap lockheed the local uh, automotive products company and our ground was up to scratch so kidderminster were promoted ahead of us so promptly kidderminster headhunted graham Olner as their manager and he moved across and several other players moved across with him I didn't go because I'd signed a contract for the following season, so I stayed at Leamington. And Kim, I believe, went and signed for Gloucester City for a season. Uh, and shows what a good goal scorer Kim was. I think he scored something like 28 goals in a relegated team. But then we got back together at Kidderminster, and then we had about six or seven very successful years at Kidderminster. And in fact, I left Kidderminster the day after Wickham beat us in the trophy final, I believe it was 93, something like that, but around that time. I'd stopped playing by then, but I was coaching, and um, we parted company then, because that was about the time I realised my, my patience as a coach was wearing thin, and I really, I, I, actually, I hated losing to Wickham in that final, um, because I felt our players weren't treating it as another game. They were treating it like an occasion. You know, they were all on the, on the um, coach taking photographs and videos, and they were more concerned about the day out rather than the actual match itself. Of course, having played for Wickham, it hurt me <laughs> losing to them, even though uh, they were the better side on the day. So overall, how do you look back at your time at the club? Oh, great. As, as, a, as an education, both uh, for football and for life. Yeah, I mean, people like... Brian Lee, who's obviously very influential on my life. I remember him saying two things to me that kept me going throughout my football career. In fact, when he received his MBE, I wrote to him about this. We were sat in the change room one day, and he went around the whole change room. We'd lost two games in a row or something, which was a crisis at the time. And he said, right, we're going to go around the change room. Everyone's going to have their say. And I was, happened to be at the end of the line. He said, right, what, what are you going to say? And I said, oh, I don't feel I can say anything. I haven't played the last two games, so, you know... And he went, I said, everyone's got to say something. And I went, I, I, I've got nothing to say. And uh, anyway, he went around the whole team and they all had that piece. And as is normal in those situations, the defenders blame the midfield players, the midfield players blame the forwards and so on, you know. And it came back to me and uh, he said, you got anything to say now? And I said, uh, no, no, sorry. And then he, he went very quiet for a minute. He, pointed, he looked around the whole uh, change room and he went, you lot ought to be ashamed of yourself. And then he pointed to me. I, I was completely stunned by this. I went bright red. He pointed to me and said, that bloke there is holding all you lot together. He hasn't been in the team, but he should be. I should be picking him over some of you lot. 
He said he comes to train every week. He tries his best. He works hard. He never moans. He, he doesn't get picked. He never moans. He just gets up and gets on with it. And you lot play like you've played for the last two weeks. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. And I'm sat there open mouthed. I, I didn't realise he thought that about me because he never spoke to you, you know, in normal course. And then he slammed the door and went out. Of course, they all looked at me and went, creep, you know, all the players. <laughs> you know, I got slaughtered for that. But that kind of thing, I didn't realise I was like that. Do you know what I mean? As a character, until he said that. And then that was such a boost to me as, as, a, as a player, as a young player, because I was just doing what I thought everyone should do, you know, just get your head down, get on with it. But actually having the recognition, that stood with me, that stayed with me for a long time. And we find you, um, we find you enjoying your retirement, presumably keeping an eye out for, for Wickham's results as well. I am, yeah, I am. Well, intriguingly enough, when we when I came down the dinner uh, and met uh, Gareth Ainsworth, he asked me where I was from, and I said Cheltenham. And Wickham, of course, were playing that the next day, weren't they? Yeah, of course. Unfortunately, lost. I couldn't go. I, I I play a bit of golf now, and I was playing golf the next day. Yeah, but I would have liked to have gone to that game. Yeah, I I, I always keep an eye out for Wickham's results. Of course, it's a much different club now in, in, a, in a, a higher league in fact when I came down to the dinner last week I didn't even know where Adams Park was I had to go and find out where it was I had to drive there first to get my bearings um, because I haven't been back in all those years oh, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you and to you Mary. thank you very much indeed Thank you very much. Brilliant to speak to uh, Graham, and uh, he now knows where Adams Park is as well. Uh, more from the Wickham Wanderers Ex Players Association next week on the show. Online, on Radio Player, and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound. This is what you might term the final part of the Wickham Wanderers show. After this, is nothing else. Um, not till next week, anyway. Uh, but first, uh, we'll, hear, we'll hear from Gareth Ainsworth as well, before that, by the way. Uh, but also, uh, first, we're very pleased to uh, feature Wickham Wanderers women uh, when we can on the show. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, Craig is with us, uh, who uh, we spoke to comparatively recently, uh, when uh, when you first started your uh, media responsibilities with the team. How's that going so far? Uh, yeah, good evening, Colin. Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been about, I think, two weeks, three weeks into into the role. I, I joined you guys on, on here and sort of to talk about and tell me everyone what I was doing and uh, yeah we're now maybe two months in two and a half months in and, and it's really good like social media content is out there um, a lot more both both videos and audio of, of, of not only the girls but Carl as well and uh, turns out a little bit of uh, a little bit of me as well so it's all going really well thanks <laughs> very nice to feature the behind the scenes bits isn't it yeah it's it's great I mean you know to, it's, it's 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 good to kind of get out there and also to to, to be able to give the girls opportunities. I mean, the last time I saw you um, and uh, and Luke in person was at the uh, Akin Fenwa um, premiere. And it was lovely to be able to to get some of the girls to come along with that, with the management, with Carl and JB, the manager and the reserve team manager. Um, so just being given, trying to give the girls as, as much opportunity as possible to be, um, as, to feel as, as important as, as rightly they should be as, as part of, of the club, as, as, a, as an overriding sort of uh, thing, if you like. Don't we sound showbiz? Last time I saw you, was at a premiere. <laughs> yes, yes, I go to a lot of those, you know. <laughs> exactly, every week. Can I'll often, see you next week. Often be seen at premieres. <laughs> <laughs> National League premiere, that sort of thing. Um, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we had um, Carl and Bobby on last week, of course, because um, we had a bit of a break with the, the, the men's action, and great to speak to them. But, and Carl was saying, obviously, that it's the second half of the season now, uh, and results is definitely something that he's, he's focusing on. Yes, I mean, you know, you don't have to be a football expert to look at the table and see Wickham, you know, sort of near the bottom of the league. But I think what Carl has installed since the summer and since he took over and bringing in, bringing in uh, JB and 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 Dan is his assistant. You know, it's it's the performances. Now, the results haven't sort of mirrored the performances. I think there's sometimes there's some weeks where, you know, if you ever come down, which I would encourage anyone to to come down to Burnham and, and to check the girls out. You know, they play incredibly attractive football, you know, uh, playing out from the back, um, getting people in the box, you know, a good, good passing, high tempo, well organised. I mean, hard tackling. It, it's 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 not where they are in the table that, that reflects how they're doing. So don't let that put you off from thinking, you know, what's going on. But yes, naturally, the next step is to turn those really good performances into results, which ultimately will will kind of push the team up. Um, the table and last season we finished uh, we finished mid table 
Um, and, you know, again, like with any league, I mean, look at, you know, we've watched uh, the, the men in League One or League Two, whatever, over the years. You you, you put a run of performances together and before you know it, you find yourself um, in the mixer. So that's certainly in the in this part of the season now where I think Carl and, and, and the team will be be looking to push towards is that mid-table spot. And I think it's something really nice about following a team from its kind of embryonic stages because obviously the new coaching staff and new, new players coming in as well and really sort of building something something special at, at, at Burnham. They are, they are, uh, Colin. I think since the summer, with you know the addition of Carl and 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 players that he's picked, and 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 Dan and JB and Ed and and you know every Christian in the under 18s and you know everyone that's involved from from you know and there's there's three teams in the in the in the women's thing. I don't think people realise that there's a genuine pathway from under eight under 18s to the first team, which is tier five. Like there is a Type tier five in the women's game, there is a genuine uh, platform for these girls to to not only grow as in, in in part of Wickham, but but showcase what they're doing. And with the addition of Carl and the addition of the the, the media attention that they're they're rightly getting now through the work that you do, that I do, that that uh, the Bucks Repress with James does, that you know we get the, the the message out there all the time. It is almost a bit like a a jet, like a reborn, if you like, a re re uh, a new start um from this summer. So. You know, now is that like I completely agree. Now is the best time to 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 be following women's football when the the Wickham Wanderers women, and especially as well the, the recent results. You're saying not the best, obviously, but there have been a couple of occasions where they've gone four 0 down, which obviously isn't ideal. But they have battled back to to sort of four three and, and you know come so close. Yeah, that's happened in like the last month um, on two two separate occasions. So they're you know just when you think you know you know oh you know this is this is not going to look good you know as a result. Um, you know, the last sort of thirty minutes, they've 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 battled really, really hard, and um, I think again that that almost nearly happened. I say nearly happened again. Obviously, Sunday's uh, result wasn't necessarily um, uh, a great one with a, with a five one defeat, but they went four what four nil down. Then they went four one, and and for the next sort of twenty minutes, half an hour, it was it was incredibly close. And the whole game, you know, the the girls they hit the post. Um, the the uh, the goalie of the other team made some some really I asked got a goalkeeper sorry made some really good saves, um, but it just wasn't our day and I think you know on some days that's going to click and and once it starts clicking I think they're going to absolutely rock it up that league and I think we're in, we're in a position at the moment where we're playing every week we're, we're chipping away we're, the girls are working the socks off one week it will just click and every shot will find the corner every shot will find. Um, um, we'll find the net and, and I think someone's in for a bit of a rude awakening I think over the next two or three weeks and something you must start to notice as well is the real togetherness amongst not just the team but the squad as well or squads well yeah this is it I, like, having having you know I've been down to training once or twice um, and uh, they all train at the same time on the Burnham pitch as well which again is is a wonderful use of the facility um, so they all they all train at the same time which allows girls that are maybe in the reserves or in the under 18s to watch first team training and to sort of see how they're developing. It gives them that aspiration to do. And, and they're all really close. I mean, there's, like I say, there's a good group of coaches and all the coaches talk and they're really close. And, um, you know, they're from my point of view as well, they're very easy to, to work with, very easy to get along with. Everyone's very accommodating, very welcoming. Uh, and the girls, I think they're doing great when it comes to like, asking them to do interviews whether that's post-match or we had a sponsor down to training the other week in, in fiber which was lovely to see them um and um you know we had some of the girls do some interviews for them uh for their social media and uh they were up for it you know and it's gone they've gone from being a bit nervous and kind of all oh, what do i do craig how do i say this you know to to being really open and 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 uh and just kind of like embracing this this change so um no a lot of credit has to go to to everyone from top to bottom so in terms of the second half of the season, uh, what's coming up uh, for them next in terms of opponents? So um, this weekend, all the teams are away, actually, which is quite rare. Normally you'd get one of the teams uh, at home, but the first team are away to Oxford City. So that lovely Wickham-Oxford uh, rivalry um, uh, going a long way. Um, the reserves are away to New Bradwell, which is near M Milton Keynes area. So again, Wickham MK kind of areas. Uh, and uh, the under-18s are away to AFC Stoneham. So three away games, which I say is quite rare. Normally one of those teams will be at the Burnham uh, Stadium. Um, so that's this Sunday. The, the the reserve team are flying. Like they they were I was with I was actually with them um not this Sunday, Sunday before, and they won uh seven uh, sorry, nine two 
Um, all those goals you can see, by the way, on the Wickham Wanderers women's Instagram account, FYI. Um, and, you know, they're, they're flying. They're top of their league and, you know, they're really pushing hard for promotion. Um, the under 18s, they come against some really uh, high quality development teams like um, for their age group, like like uh, Derby, uh, Nottingham Forest. Um, so, you know, they're, play they're playing teams that, you know, everyone would have heard of before. Um, and then obviously the first team is, like I say, it's a project. Like the whole Rome wasn't built in a day. That's 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 what we're doing in the first team. That's what um, that's what we're pushing for. And I think, you know, uh, three points away at Oxford, um, you know, men, women or whatever. I think that sounds wonderful. No, yeah. definitely. A, a real great opportunity for, for people to, to, to back the chair girls as well in the coming weeks. And, and as you say, uh, really get down to, to Burnham and, and support the teams. Yes, definitely. You know, if like the next two or three weeks, we've we've got games, but then there is a small uh, a small Christmas break. Um, but then that reconvenes very early on in, in January. So um, if you are looking to come down, like, you know, again, I would, would recommend you coming down um, uh, the following Sunday. Absolutely. Well, it's been brilliant to have you on. Thank you so much indeed for your time. You're very welcome, Colin. Have a lovely evening and take care. Uh, you too. Uh, Craig, who does uh, some uh, media for Wickham Wanderers Women, speaking to us here at Wickham Sound. Uh, and uh, obviously wish the chair girls all the best in the coming uh, weekend's fixtures and the coming weeks as well. And we'll be uh, continuing to follow them on the Wickham Wanderers show. Uh, we return our attention now, though, to the men's game. And, of course, speak to the manager, Gareth Ainsworth, who did his uh, press session uh, a day early uh, this week. And uh, brilliant to catch up with him and uh, find out how um, he and the team have been doing uh, with our game on Saturday, what they got up to. No, they had some time off, Colin. They had, uh, sometimes the mental break's really important for them and uh, the four days that they had, Friday to Monday, I think they took it the right way, you know. I don't think there was any partying going on or going away. I think it was more families and Christmas markets and uh, and, and watching the World Cup. But um, I think being away from the place sometimes enthuses them and, and the hunger to come back and, and, and get stuck in again has been great this week and uh, we're working hard towards the, the big game on Sunday now which is uh, which is the biggest game on Sunday by the way the uh, Wick and Portsmouth game <laughs> there's a smaller one on later on in the day I'm, I'm only kidding but um, we're looking forward to to seeing what we can do against Portsmouth one of the fancy teams in the league you know underdogs again probably us and uh, and uh, hopefully we can you know we can uh, cause a bit of a shock have you found the the break uh, extra time as well? Sort of preparation really useful. Yeah, definitely. You know, you need time sometimes as a manager to to reset yourself. Never mind the players. You know, you, nobody nobody gives us time off, and uh, and I, you are rushed off your feet at times. I'm not known in in the slightest. I love it. You know, and, and um, I've had some fantastic experiences lately with the, the you know the the NHS and the One Can Trust and and um, the hospitals coming up soon. You know, all important things that I want to make sure that my standing in the community is, is used in the right way as, as as well as just being the football manager who, who gets this place going as well so yeah I wouldn't have it any other way love it all and uh, and hopefully we can uh, we can have a positive result Sunday yeah, It feels like a really sort of important time of the year doesn't it to be to be doing those things in the community and only sort of putting the, the club stamp as well on, on, on the area and what, what influence it can have it's Christmas, Colin. Come on, yeah, of course it's an important time of the year. You know, we, we've uh, we've got to make sure that everyone is, uh, you know, is happy. It's been uh, it's been a tough couple of years, and and probably people are still thinking it's it's getting tough. You know, with with cost of living and and wars and 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 all this sort of stuff going on. You know, that that makes me realise just how important that um, that spirit, that community spirit, is, and uh, and especially the one cam when I went there and heard some of the stories, it was really perspective for me we're so lucky you know we really are and uh, and these boys they want to grab every opportunity they can get out on that pitch and, and kicking a ball around and getting paid for it it's, it's a wonderful job and uh, and they're all fantastic players and deserve where they, they should be but um, you know it's, it's nice to have some perspective in life and uh, and making a difference to, to those who need it a really nice to have these couple of weeks as well to get um, injured players back as well and, and I guess is that, as, you, as you say a bit of a rest for, for some of the others too yeah, and, and we will have one or two back, you know, and Chris Farino um, is out on the training pitch now, which is great. You know, we had a couple of international boys back, so even Curtis Thompson's been out there now, which is brilliant to see. So we're getting to full squad capacity, which is brilliant for me. You know, all, all, what that does is gives me headaches on team selection and sub-selection because uh, everyone can't fit into 18, but by the by, it's, uh, it's up for grabs now and that's how it should be. It's, uh, it's a brilliant place to be and, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, I say what we can do on Saturday, uh, on Sunday <laughs> against Portsmouth. You mentioned that the size of the game, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, for fans to come down and see two, two title uh, promotion contenders, you know, really sort of going for it. 
and stick around for for maybe another title contenders of England in the World Cup. So yeah, I mean, what a day, what a day, you know, to get down to Adams Park. Um, you, you know, Rob has has tried to make this stadium as as you know accessible and, and 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 as nice as it can be, but ultimately it's the football on the pitch that gets people in there. And we want we want to make sure that we're putting on good performances week in week out down there. It's, we're proud of Adams Park and we're proud of uh, of our home and uh, and a club like Portsmouth coming there. Honestly, again, we we still pinch ourselves because first time they came a few years ago, it was like right Portsmouth are a massive club, Sunderland have come massive club, Sheffield Wednesday are coming massive club. Now it's sort of commonplace that these teams are coming and. Uh, and we shouldn't take that for granted. We really have done well here at Wickham Wanderers, you know, um, the, the fans, the players, the staff, everyone involved in, in the rise of this club and uh, and these moments are special. So, yeah, it's a huge club coming, but um, it's brilliant to be on a, on a level playing pitch with, with them. A really nice for anyone who can't make it um, to watch on TV. A, a brilliant opportunity for the club. A great advert for the for the team as well with the, the innovation that's going to be uh, on display on Sunday. Yeah, Sky have asked for all sorts of things, you know, micing up everywhere. I think it was micing up the night before in in, in bed probably and, and there's no chance that they can have all the, 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 all that sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> what I want for breakfast and, and, you know, I might go as far as letting them see me drive in, but, um, you know, the, there's, uh, there's a line that you draw. Um, but I will say that on TV, I think you'll get a few more, a few more angles, a bit more footage than usual and, uh, and the innovation that, um, you know, that it's, the world's going that way, isn't it? Access and content and everything. And you look at the Saudi Arabia manager when he was in the dressing room at half time against Argentina, that's gone viral and little bits and bobs in the World Cup, I think, has projected this into into the into the public eye. And I think Sky wanna do a little bit with uh with Wick and Portsmouth and again, we should be very proud of that. So yeah, looking forward to seeing uh hopefully a good performance, plenty of footage, and then we can uh, we can all settle down and watch England hopefully beat Senegal. <laughs> and also really interesting for fans as well to be able to, I guess, to sort of hear from you at half time and, and get a real kind of behind the scenes feel as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, they won't be hearing everything, but at <laughs> it's going well. I'll probably give them more, info, uh, more footage than if it's not going well, but um, we'll see. There, there, there was all sorts asked for, um, I have to say, um, you know, we'll be as accommodating as possible, but uh, we have a job to do and I never want to let the... Uh, you know, the, the bells and whistles take over the actual crux of the job, which is beating Portsmouth and finding a way to, to do that. If we can do that with all the cameras and all the, all the microphones on, brilliant. Um, but I won't let it get in the way. It's, uh, it's a really important part of the season for us. And, uh, and Cheltenham was disappointing. I want to get back to winning ways and no time like the present. Pleasure to speak to you, the manager, Gareth Ainsworth, looking ahead to the next game, which of course is the visit of Portsmouth to Adams Park. A reminder that it's on Sunday at 12.30, uh, televised match. Uh, you can hear it on Wanderers TV and of course uh, follow live commentary here on Wickham Sound on 106.6. Match build-up starts uh, an hour before and the kickoff is, as I say, at 12.30 and as I say, with the uh, the Sky uh, com- uh, coverage, uh, it's uh, they, they've, they've designated it an innovative uh, game uh, where there'll be uh, plenty more sort of angles and behind the scenes footage. Uh, there'll be uh, club staff on hand uh, with some uh, summarising. As I say, uh, they're hoping to uh, speak to the managers at half time as well so you can get a real kind of insight and feel closer to the action. Hope you enjoyed the show this week. Uh, back at the same time next week, reflecting on that game, of course, uh, looking ahead to the next one as well uh, with the Wickham Wanderers Ex Player Association due to be chatting to Stuart Lewis as well. Uh, we'll be following Wickham Wanderers Women. And um, thanks to uh, Craig as well, to Greg. Graham, who appeared on the show. Great to catch up with Josh Go and check out Wanderers TV, as mentioned, for the full interview of that and join Phil for match commentary from the game at home to Portsmouth Sunday lunchtime at 12.30 and then hopefully uh, watching uh, England get a good result against Senegal in the World Cup as well. Uh, have a uh, fantastic week and uh, look forward to speaking to you next week.